Hi everyone, we're coming very close now to the end of our journey together. Our journey through Lent, our journey to Jerusalem. The scripture that we're looking at today is Luke 24, verses 1 to 5, and we're going to particularly focus on, focus on verse 5. You know, the disciples didn't simply go home on that Sabbath evening as dusk fell, and the woman returned from watching the burial of the body of Jesus in a rock you tomb. They seem to need each other. And you do need each other when you're bewildered. You do need each other when you're frightened, when you're anxious, when you're not quite ready to ride off the whole of the last three years. It looks like they made their way to the same room where they'd eaten that last Passover with Jesus the previous evening. And I guess there they shared the emotions and the distress of that long Friday. Their leader, their teacher, their Lord was dead. Dead. They'd seen his body on the cross. Surely that wasn't the end of the story. Perhaps they spoke quietly about the mysterious phrase frequently added by Jesus to his prophetic warnings about the fate that will be in store for him in Jerusalem and on the third day rise again. They were aware of the thinking behind resurrection. It's the belief of most Jews at the time, with the exceptions of the Sadducee. But they'd always thought of it as taking place in the future, associated perhaps with the day of judgment or, or a time of judgment, the day of the Lord. They had no notion of individual resurrection here and now. And the conversation with Jesus and Martha after the death of her brother Lazarus bears that out. Jesus said that her brother would rise again, to which she replied, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. With that belief, the disciples would have had no problem. But three days after being killed, he will rise again. What could that mean? Their whole attitude on that long Sabbath day and the next morning tells us that there was really no expectation that Jesus would rise from the dead. Certainly not there and then. They behaved like men and women who'd been bereaved. Some of them, well, they were anxious to honour him with the simple rites of passage. Some were numb with despair, some torn between a vague hope and a desperate longing. With real love and devotion, the faithful women made their way to the tomb the moment the Sabbath was over at early dawn, says Luke. They came to anoint the body of Jesus. All the Gospels tell us that Mary Magdalene was one of them. The identity of her companions varies slightly between the Gospels, but it would seem that there were a party of three or four. And as they approached the tomb, they wondered what they could do to roll away the heavy stone that closed the entrance. But in the event, they had no need to worry. To their surprise and perhaps shock, the stone had already been rolled away and the tomb laid open. Hmm. Grave robbers, perhaps. It was a rich man's tomb, even if the man in it wasn't rich. They made their way into the tomb. From the bright light of early morning into the dark. Luke describes two men whose clothes gleamed like lightning, messengers of the Lord, someone sent to do his bidding. And when they spoke, their message was clear, it was concise. It was amazing. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. He is not here. He is risen. Those words are the beginning. The beginning of the resurrection story. The angelic messenger had delivered their message. Two crystal clear elements. The first was that Jesus is not here, which the disciples could see for themselves. The tomb was empty. The second was the explanation for that emptiness. He is risen. The one who being crucified, the one whose dead body, dead cold body, the women had escorted to that very tomb on Friday evening was not there on Sunday morning because he was somewhere else. 
He was alive, raised by the power of God. Now, a lot was to follow that discovery. Soon they would see him. And that seeing will become the very heart of the apostolic message. We have seen the Lord. Soon the other disciples and Peter would see him. What reassurance there must have been in those words for the failed leader of the twelve. He would see him and know that this was not an hallucination. It's what actually happened. The women ran off with their message, frightened and excited. And as it was passed on, as it was tested, as it was believed, history changed. The life of Jesus had not ended in tragedy and death, but in triumph and life. The two greatest enemies of the human race, sin and darkness, had been faced and overcome. Nothing, nothing was going to be quite the same ever again. And now, and now it begins.